Hello, welcome to this recording of the uh, meeting that we held on April 13th through the 15th, 2021 with the Aquatic Invasive Species Partnership and the Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area groups. All of us from throughout Wisconsin. And we joined on Wednesday of our meeting week for topics with an aquatic invasive species focus. There's several topics here I hope that you'll be interested in checking out. They'll be divided up so that you can get to them without having to go through a lot of the extra rigmarole in a meeting. We did have an interesting discussion at the end of the day about how we want to consider approaching aquatic invasive species, a new discovery, and make it less scary for people because sometimes people react strongly and there isn't always a need. So I will also include the open discussion that we had following a breakout session when we did that. I hope you are able to get a lot out of this recording and please enjoy. But we are gonna, um, we're gonna start hearing about CD3 results and Sam's gonna just sort out sharing her screen. <laughs> this might take a few seconds. All right, does this look like you guys can see stuff maybe? Um, seeing your regular screen for PowerPoint. Is this good? You guys see everything? You Maybe. are in presentation mode, ma'am. Yes. I thought that was going to take way longer. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll just jump right in. Um, I'm Sam Coyne. I'm up in Door County. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you guys about some CD3 units. Uh, I'll give you a brief introduction of kind of where Door County is and what our demographic is. Uh, annually, we have about 2 million visitors come up to lovely Door County and play tourist. Um, and we have only about 27,500 residents. Um, so we have a lot more tourists than residents. And so our like outreach and demographic is really, really different. Um, and so I kind of wanted to give that background before we kind of dove into what our numbers are. Um, and when we talk about these numbers, just bear with me, they're really, really soft. Um, we had some issues with some data collection. So it's more of like soft trends that we're seeing. Um, for those of you who don't know what CD3 units are, they are boat cleaning stations. Uh, they have different models. We have this kind of stationary model that's solar powered um, and it has a variety of tools. It has like a vacuum, a blower tool, a hand tool. Uh, it has lights so if people are there early morning or late at night, they can still use them. Um, and the nice thing about these units is there's no running water to them so we don't have to really worry about like winterizing them too much. There is a holding tank for everything the vacuum takes up and so you have to empty that periodically. Um, we opted to install a little pamphlet box on ours so there is like a takeaway that boaters can take with them and it walks them through what each tool is, how to clean their boats, and then the units themselves have this stopais.com on them and so if a boater goes to that website, they can see what watercraft they have and how to kind of clean it, um, which is a really nice feature. Uh, we also opted to use local photos of Door County to remind people of why we actually care about um, preventing AIS, especially in the lens of Door County, and um, hoping that people kind of take pride in their water. Um, and then we funded this through Wisconsin Coastal Management Program, um, which is was fantastic and so we had to make sure we included all of the information of who our partners were. We had to make sure NOAA was on there, Wisconsin Coast was on there, everyone wanted to get their recognition so that was really um, good uh, and so that's why we have like those little giant stickers I guess on there. Um, so the CD3 units that we have they record data and so this is just a glimpse of what the portal looks like. You get a, a like a login and it logs how many times each tool is used. And then it will, through an algorithm, generate how many sessions. And it tells you the time and date of each session. 
And then you can export that data um, into an Excel file. Um, so there's a ton of different information that can kind of come from this. Um, and so this is kind of important to keep in mind as we go into the data a little further. Uh, and then when we started this whole process, we recognized outreach would be really critical. Um, these units kind of look like foreign alien machines um, and I think can be really intimidating to the public. So we had to come up with different kind of platforms to engage and then also keep in mind this is 2020. Uh, so we had to kind of figure out how to do this in a kind of remote way. Um, so we engaged the public through radio interviews. Um, we did a lot of social media and Facebook posts. We also have a newsletter um, that we publish. And so we provided information in there. We also have a website that we provided um, different links so people can see what these vote cleaning stations are. Um, and then we also did a whole bunch of newspaper interviews. Um, and so one of the things that we definitely uh, realized is we needed to have different means of communication. Um, not everyone learns the same. So we had to, again, we have those pamphlets that so we were providing pictures as well as written instructions. Um, so in those pamphlets, there's like little figures like using the vacuum and showing how to do it. Um, then we also did the pictures and videos. So we had, um, there's a local Facebook group that does kind of like videos. And so it was a kind of instructional video and introducing people to it. Um, and then we, through uh, the radio interviews, we did, again, audio kind of. And then we also did kind of provide this remote hands-on training where um, for Clean Boats, Clean Waters, if we were out there with people and we could talk to them about how to use it. Um, and that was interesting and kind of fun all in itself. Um, so that's kind of what we did to get these systems up and going. And so I'm gonna introduce you also now to where they are. Um, so this is Penny Park. Penny Park is just north of the Sturgeon Bay Canal. Um, and that red box on the right is where the station is placed currently. Um, and so we place the stations there at our two busiest boat launches in the county, and they're county boat launches. Um, and there's like a whole process in getting them installed. Um, if you have more questions on that, I can always touch on that. Um, it's all part of the requirements for Wisconsin Coastal. Um, but so we were able to get them installed. Uh, so this one's at Penny Park. And I'm gonna just walk through kind of what the demographic is of Penny Park. Um, Penny Park is more of our like tourist visitors park, I guess. It's about 50% fishermen and 50% water recreational usage. Um, we do see a lot of charter fishermen in and out of there. Uh, the water gets relatively deep right off the boat launch. Um, and so, when you're looking at the data, it's really important to consider um, kind of who was getting the messaging and um, how you can tweak your messaging. And so we had to kind of keep in mind that um, this boat launch is pretty much more tourist than um, our year round uh, residents. And so when we looked at the data, this graph is really busy, so I'll walk you through it. Um, on the left, we have the percent usage, and so we realized we couldn't really use daily fees, daily launch fees. Um, we could in May because they were slow enough that people were still paying daily launch fees. But when June rolled around, um, I think we had three times the amount of annual boat launch um, passes sold than we did like the entire year of 2019. And so we realized we weren't able to track through our daily launch fees anymore. Um, and so we had to kind of modify our strategy and we based it off of our clean boats, clean waters efforts. Um, as you can tell, all of this data has, again, the numbers are really squishy. Um, we looked using our clean boats, clean waters data, how many people were at the launches during those efforts. Um, and then our outreach, which is that orange line, uh, and the number of outreach events is on the right side of the graph. Um, those are, you know, did we have newspaper uh, articles, you know, clean boat, clean waters efforts occurring that month, that sort of thing. Um, and as you can see at Penny Park, we didn't really see any clear trends. We thought we would, um, but we ended up not really seeing anything related to outreach versus kind of the usage um, and so we thought that was kind of odd, but again, keeping in mind that Penny Park is mainly um, kind of the tourists and seasonal visitors, we were thinking maybe that they aren't getting the same messaging. 
Um, so then we kind of dove into the data seeing if maybe if there are presence of if we have someone at the boat launch, does it create pressure for people to use the boat cleaning stations? And um, this graph shows kind of when we had a clean boat, clean waters representative present and when we didn't. And turns out we really didn't see any pressure by having a clean boats, clean waters representative present in the usage of the CD3 stations. Um, so we didn't see a clear trend one way or another. Um, so essentially with Penny Park, we came up with, we don't know what's going on. Um, but then with our second boat launch uh, is Carmody Park, which is south of the Sturgeon Bay Canal. And um, where you see that red box again, that's where the station is. Um, and Carmody is primarily utilized by sports fishermen and locals. And it's relatively shallow water and it has a marina associated with the launch. Um, and we ended up seeing very different data. With Carmody, we ended up seeing that um, whether or not it was through outreach or just them generating kind of a behavioral trend, we ended up seeing usage increase from about 5% to 20%, um, which we thought was really interesting. Um, and then when we looked at the usage of clean boats, like versus the clean boats, clean waters representatives being present, we ended up seeing again that there wasn't a huge um, indicator other than what was weird is there it appeared we had more usage when a representative wasn't present and so we were wondering if clean boats clean waters um you know them being walked through the process through having a representative there talking to them about clean boats clean waters made them feel that they didn't need to necessarily um use the cd3 station um but when there wasn't a representative present that maybe they felt they wanted to use the CD3 station. You don't really know for sure. Um, again, this, these pieces of data are really soft. Um, and so when you look at the two stations next to each other, again, Penny being kind of the more tourist and Carmody being more of the local, we were trying to see what trends we were seeing. And the one that really stuck out is that Carmody, we saw kind of a clear increasing trend over time. And Penny, we kind of, weren't able to piece anything together. Um, and so we were wondering, maybe are the vacationers missing their um, kind of our media blitzes? Are they missing us? You know, are they not reading the articles in the paper? Are they not listening to the local radio? You know, what are the things that, what efforts are kind of influencing it? And we still don't really have answers to that, but it's kind of a question going into 20, um, 21 that we're looking to kind of get those answers. The other things that we wanted to consider is um, the stations, they're in two very different locations. So Penny Park, um, the station is located where the red box is, and then that kind of yellow box with the stripes through it, people can park there. And so the traffic flow for Penny Park in those stations we were wondering if that also influenced the usage of those stations. It was kind of not in the best spot and there's not a lot of really easy traffic flow in and around it. Um, whereas with Carmody, it's located right on a pull off so they can easily just pull over and people can still navigate around them. No one's blocking them from the front or the back and there's not really a lot of pressure. And so we were thinking maybe the station location is also part of it. Um, and so that was one thing. The other thing is when we're talking about these boat cleaning stations, there's a lot of different models that you can look at either purchasing through CD3 or you can also look at like there are boat sanitation stations and that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, going forward with this project, there are different options out there. Uh, we're right now talking with the city of Sturgeon Bay who has a boat launch that has a whole bunch of amenities. They have running water, they have access to electricity, and they're looking at installing a true sanitation station. Um, and so when you're talking about these boat cleaning stations, it's really important to look at what are your site restrictions? What do you need to make sure you have access to? And then the other thing is, um, you know, electricity. As I said, these are solar powered. We don't have running electricity to these sites. And so having the solar powered was like a must have for us. Um, so that was really important when we were considering what stations we wanted to use. Um, and then, the things that you also need to consider when you're talking about installing these stations are kind of what are your user groups? As I said, 
um, Penny Park and Carmody have kind of two different characteristics of users. And we, moving forward, need to look at how do we address these different user groups. Um, we're starting to see that we have a very clear trend with our locals, which is great. They're learning and they're developing behaviors. And I don't want to change that at all. I want to encourage that. But also, how do we make sure we catch the um, tourists who are coming through? Um, and as I said, these were funded through Wisconsin Coastal Management. Um, and so we had um, we had certain specific funding requirements and site requirements that we had to meet anyway. Um, so depending on how you end up looking getting these funded, it's really important to consider those. We also ran into a whole suite of issues and I'm also gonna be upfront about what the costs are for these units. Uh, we found for both units, the annual cost was about $1,750. Um, and those are not fixed costs. And so those do increase. Um, the benefit of having those is it does track the data. Um, but again, that data doesn't really tell you the percentage of users. It just tells you how many people are using the station. So if you wanna use that data, it's, you have to kind of start getting creative of how do you track how many people are using that boat launch. Um, and then also initial costs for the installation, they are pretty pricey. It's $31,175. Um, and that's when we went through it in 2019. So um, I'm sure these probably have gone up with the cost of materials lately. Um, and we also ran into an issue. They updated the modems, which was really great. So they would be able to have uh, more precise uh, tracking. Um, but when they replaced our modem, we ended up having a whole state of issues. So pretty much from August till like October, uh, our data, we didn't really have um, the time and date data collected. Um, so it wasn't the best. Um, and that I don't think would be a continual issue. It was just something that we experienced this year. Um, and as I said, one of the biggest issues we're currently facing is how do we address the over 2 million seasonal visitors um, and make sure that they're getting the same messaging or um, the type of messaging that they'll be able to hear and pick up on. Uh, so we also installed um, two low-tech boat cleaning station AIS removal stations. Um, and we did not track any data there this year. We will be um, having like a sign-up sheet there. Again, it's going to be somewhat problematic in saying how many people use it, but we want to look at kind of what we're seeing for usage at those stations as well. Um, and for future planning, um, as I said, uh, the city of Sturgeon Bay, at our, one of our more local launches, is that they're looking at kind of setting a different boat cleaning station. So we might have a whole suite of different boat cleaning stations and it'll be really interesting to see kind of what we're looking at for patterns and trends. Um, one of the things that we ran into is we have to figure out how we're gonna accurately or hopefully develop more clear trend lines um, through data tracking. It's really hard to figure out how to go about counting the amount of people who go in and out of these boat launches because they're associated oftentimes with parks and other things. Um, so there was some debate of if we're gonna install like traffic counters and that sort of thing, or are we just gonna try and do manual counts and have just like a random sampling day once a week? Um, we're still trying to kind of piece in that information together. And then we just have to really, I think, up our outreach. We did a pretty good job in 2020. Um, and with 2021, as we're able to do more things in person, we're hoping that that will also um, increase the amount of people uh, using these stations. Um, and we're also going to be upping our uh, social media. So that'll be really exciting. And that's pretty much it for my trends. Again, all these numbers are very, very soft, but I can talk more about it if you guys have any questions. Thanks, Sam. Um, go ahead, folks, throw out your questions. We have plenty of time. I don't know if that breakout room lasted shorter than I set it for or whatever, but uh, we are, are definitely good for a while here. Hey, Sam. Yeah. Have you targeted any outreach towards uh, convenience stores, gas stations, such. I mean, obviously, the, people are hitting that first 
a lot of times because they need to gas up the boat and maybe they're grabbing ice or soda or something like that for a day on the water. Um, just curious. Yeah, yeah. we're um, we actually just started compiling a list also with um, the places that rent watercraft too, um, so they can get additional messaging. Um, but that was one thing we missed this last year was definitely hitting. There's like, if you don't know Door County, there's like a handful of like gas stations that are pretty much as you enter door. Um, and those are the ones that we're going to have to hit up this year for sure and have information at. Um, there's a lot of things that we're learning. <laughs> yeah, you're in kind of a unique situation because you, there's really only one way to get there. So I'm not always the biggest fan, and I know uh, some of the data doesn't show that um, billboards are the best option, but holy smokes, I mean, it's the only way people can get there. Maybe, maybe a picture of that just giving somebody the, a quick look, hey, FYI, you're going to see these. Yeah, and that's, um, we've kind of talked about like, again, because Door County is like, the nice thing is we're a narrow peninsula and you have to take the highway. Um, and so that was like another thing is how do we, uh, you know, if it's through billboards or even just having temporary signage or um, like making sure we get that message out. We are in a like really lucky and unique situation by having the highway as kind of the, um, you know, main lifeblood through door. I know, again, all of our situation, I feel like it's a weird spot because we're really unique. Um, but yeah, it's definitely worthwhile to look into. You have a lot of good questions coming in in the chat here. Um, gosh, I don't know where to start. I'm I'll let you, if you're able to see them uh, instead of me. Just all right. I'm going to just Scroll up to the top for a second. Um, that's a job. All right. Are trail cameras kosher when it comes to data collection? Uh, we've actually thought about this is using uh, trail cameras. I think it could be good. I mean, and also I think it would create enough pressure on people. Like we also, there is that element we want to not like force people or guilt them into it, but if they like know people are kind of watching, I think it would maybe be worthwhile to look at using a trail camera. I know it wasn't something that we initially thought of, but um, I of course will have to run it by our county lawyer to make sure that they aren't gonna, you know, push back at us. Because <laughs> um, data tracking has definitely been one of our biggest kind of headaches. Um, even though it's just preliminary data, and I understand we have a lot to learn. Do I think CD3s were worth it? Um, it really depends, I guess. Um, considering it was grant funded, I think it was worth it um, because we weren't necessarily paying out of pocket. But there is a lot of things that we're still kind of sorting out. Um, and the cost of these units, they are pretty pricey, um, especially if you have a fixed budget um, and you think about kind of the outreach. Again, our numbers are really hard to look at and get an idea of, but when you're comparing them to like the Clean Boats, Clean Waters inspector, um, you know, I think over the cost, like over 10 years, if the fixed cost of a Clean Boats, Clean Waters inspector is like $4,000. Again, all of these are gonna be really soft, but you know, you're looking at a potentially about uh, 10 years worth of clean boats, clean waters personnel for one CD3 station. And so I think it really depends on if you are in the right location to use it. And you know, is it worthwhile? Like, are they areas that you're going to be putting um, someone out there? Uh, the nice thing is they do have holding tanks and they have alarms, so they don't really require a lot of maintenance. Um, but on the other hand, um, you still, when you initially install them, you're going to have to do a lot of introduction and kind of training. So you're going to spend a lot of time that at least first few years, um, getting people used to them until they become much more commonplace. So I, I don't really, I, I don't know if I would say it's necessarily, I think it's worth it in specific situations. 
Um, can you talk more about the process of getting funds and then installation in units? Yeah. Um, so we applied for a Wisconsin Coastal Management Grant um, in before I started actually with the county. So I think this was back in 2018. Um, and it, I guess it's a pretty lengthy process. I don't know if you've ever applied for a Wisconsin Coastal Management Program grant. Um, there are, uh, there are a great grant. There's a lot of flexible funding, um, but it is kind of a timely, like a, a consuming process. Um, and you also have to go through kind of all the ESA NEPA review process as well on the tail end. Um, and they are, they usually the grants run, they're a year long grant, they run I think June or July to June slash July following year. Um, and you can always ask for extensions. Um, and so it was a pretty intensive process. We had to, because our county um, launches are also partially owned by uh, some of the land is DNR land. And um, so we had to go through a whole process of getting affidavits from um, the DNR who owned it. Um, and then also getting um, affidavits from our parks department um, saying that it's all access to the public, that we're meeting all the environmental stuff and that sort of thing. Um, it's a pretty, um, it's a good process to go through, but it is can be a little bulky. Um, and Wisconsin Coastal, um, we just recently applied for another one. It is a somewhat competitive process, but you can make the argument for these units that they are needed um, and they have funded ours. So I, I think they would fund them in the future. Um, do we have any issues with vandalism? We actually don't have any issues with vandalism, but we have issues with people trying to clean their cars with them. Um, <laughs> and so we like, we put a boat thing on them. We advertise that they're boat cleaning stations. There's even like on the stations themselves, they say they're boat cleaning stations. Um, but that can be sometimes a little frustrating, but we, our parks department is pretty active. And so they're out on those sites, um, unless someone's there at like three o'clock in the morning, um, we aren't gonna catch them trying to clean their car with it. Um, and so that's also the other issue is sometimes with this data, um, you just have to kind of assume that they're using them for what the usage is meant for, because um, we aren't out there all the time. But I think going back to the trail camera idea um, might help kind of catching uh, anyone who's misusing them. Did your grant funding cover the entire unit and installation? So uh, with the grant, so Wisconsin Coastal, we, I forget what the threshold is, but it ended up being a 60-40 grant. So we had to come up with 60% match and 40% was covered by um, the grant itself. And so our parks department helped pitching in. So they have the boat launch fees. Um, and so that was how we started helping float some of those costs. We also had at the time um, other grants in parallel um, because Wisconsin Coastal is weirdly a federal grant. Uh, we had a few state grants actually through the DNR that we were able to match some of our um, outreach efforts with. Um, so we're able to come up with the match pretty easily. Um, but the grant funding only covered, I think it ended up being 40% of the units. Um, and so, and I believe our parks department ended up pitching in the rest. Um, so again, depending on, I know with Wisconsin Coastal, I don't know what the threshold is. You could, I think, get for at least one unit 50-50, if I remember correctly, but you'll have to check with that particular grant funding source and see what their requirements are. Um, considering you have 2 million visitors coming in, are you focusing your CD3 units to be used as voters come in or as they leave? We are targeting it more as they leave. Um, we, so when we're like in there in person, we do talk to them about like the importance of having a clean boat before they go in the water. Um, but for sure, as they leave, um, Indoor County, we unfortunately also have um, near the canal, we have starry stonework. Um, and so that's something that we really try and also address when we're talking uh, with boat users as they're uh, taking the boats out of the water. Um, and again, you know, like we're hopeful that people are just using them um, at this point. So I hope that answers that question. 
Do you have any idea of the perce uh, perceptions of the boat launch managers or the public? I have like. Um, so we don't have an idea of what the perceptions are of the CD3 stations versus the low tech cleaning stations. We have had um, a few charter fishermen reach out to us and say they really like the boat cleaning stations being there, um, which I think is a good sign. Um, they've been using them pretty frequently. The low tech boat cleaning stations, we've targeted them more at um, there are like our third and fourth most used county boat launches. Um, and so they tend to be a lot of the smaller boat craft. Um, we don't really see the charter fishermen coming through. Um, and we did see, at least according to the amount of bleach water that was used, uh, we did see some usage. Um, but again, we kind of want to get a better idea of how many people are really using them. Um, and the low tech boat cleaning stations uh, do require at least weekly maintenance, if not more, um, because you need to replace that bleach water in order for it to be active. Uh, Emily, hopefully I will have an update uh, maybe next year. I don't know. I'm feeling hopeful that we'll get more data this year and actually be able to say more concrete opinions. <laughs> um, I mean, I think this would be really good. Uh, this is Amanda Smith's, uh, it's not a question, but an idea. Minnesota DNR requires anglers to sign an AIS prevention commitment statement. When they get a license, this concept could be applied to the boat launch passes and encourage users to use the CD3 if available in Wisconsin AIS laws in general. We also, in conjunction with this, we have a uh, desist of the Door County Invasive Species Team um, we have like a pamphlet that we've handed out now. I think we've handed out over 600 currently. Um, when they buy their annual passes, they now get a, a pamphlet talking about AIS, different invasives in Door County and why we care about them and how to report them. Um, because we noticed that we weren't necessarily getting our messaging out to everyone. Um, and so that was another pamphlet that was funded through this Wisconsin Coastal Management Grant. Um, but I do like the idea of being able to uh, address that more. Um, but thank you for that, Amanda. When hunters buy licenses in Wisconsin, you want to hunt migratory birds, you need to be HIP certified. This is done by answering a few questions. I wonder if this could be applied when buying fishing licenses. English would need to review the AIS on that. I think that would be really interesting. Um, and I'm gonna look at someone from the DNR do that. <laughs> um, I also agree with Jeannie, what is HIP? Okay, there we go. Because um, I think that could be really worthwhile. Oftentimes, um, you know, we'll see uh, through Clean Boat, Clean Waters, we'll see people from Minnesota. Um, they'll talk about why, like, they know the importance of cleaning their boats and that they're required to and this whole thing. Um, but sometimes we don't see the same thing in um, of our Wisconsin voters. And so I think it's really important for them to maybe be notified of this or um, at least have access to this. Like I know they have access, they could Google it and that sort of thing, but maybe having it as part of um, their process. And that's why like when we have our, um, they get their launch fee or they get their launch stickers, um, we've been giving them the information and enforcing kind of what's stated um, with the DNR, um, but I think it would be worthwhile to maybe spread that message like wider, I guess. Um, yeah, so that's it. There you go, you got it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I see my date is earlier. So this is probably just, I'm recycling a PowerPoint that I just um, prepared for a DNR presentation. Um, so it's the folks on the call that are DNR, you've seen this before and anyone who saw my presentation at the Lakes Convention has seen this, um, but it's still pretty cool information and maybe things have changed just a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna give you guys an update on what the monitoring efforts were in 2020 and what we found um, and who found what. Um, so this is our monitoring partnership. It's DNR and the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership. So that includes UW, UW Extension, Citizen Lake Monitoring, Water Action Volunteers, River Alliance of Wisconsin, and then just all the other partners in the state that conduct monitoring. 
and then as you all know, uh, coronavirus appeared in the United States globally and affected really everybody. <clears throat> um, we had to develop a Badger bounce back plan that you guys would have all heard about because there are different iterations of the same same thing um, across the state within the different programs where we essentially were teleworking when possible. Um, indoors, you had to wear face masks, stay six feet apart, same with outdoors. And we had to have groups of less than 10 people and then ride alone in cars. That's just a summary of, of what we had to do. Um, and these are just some screenshots of people in 2020 and how work was going. Lots of webinars, working with kids at homes, which was a challenge for a lot of us, um, and wearing face masks everywhere. Um, so we had to rethink everything that we did. We typically have a train the trainer trainings, which is typically in person, and then regional staff will host trainings for staff, DNR staff, and then invite partners, counties, everybody to, to attend, but we couldn't do that in 2020. Um, everything was done virtually. So we started hosting a lot of webinars. Um, our first webinar was on identification review. We used to have specimens in hand um, so you guys could see the prohibited and common restricted in species. We went through all of that just virtually. Um, with multiple people that helped with presentations and we recorded those. Uh, it was pretty well attended. There were over 120 people that attended the ID training and then we made those links available so anybody could watch them. And then um, we reviewed the verification process to remind folks that you need to send specimens to local DNR so that they can get verified and appear, um, a record would appear on our, on our website. Um, and then we went out and we did some monitoring. I just have a few pictures um, from 2020 to give you ideas of what people did. You guys all did it too. The picture on the upper left is a group of people that got to meet up, less than 10 people staying six feet apart and we all wore face masks. Um, that was for um, Japanese stilt grass and La Crosse area, La Crosse County. It's the only population we've documented in the state of Wisconsin, pretty close to streams and that's where it will become a problem is is if um, it gets near a stream, it'll spread like wildfire, so we, we believe. Um, so we were concerned about that and a group of people went to the La Crosse area so we could monitor. Um, then we've got little pictures of Shelby out looking for water hyacinth and um, Horicon Marsh. And then Amy was really creative this summer so she could go out with partners because we were supposed to be alone in cars, but she would go out with kayaks and had keep people six feet apart. Um, and then you see a picture of Shelby and I in a stream um, collecting New Zealand mud snails, but we had to stay apart, as you all did too. Um, we did develop new tools, which is crazy that we were able to pull it off, but we had planned it the year before, so we thought, well, let's try. <laughs> so we had three different big projects. One was um, for environmental DNA um, method optimization. We worked with the state lab to develop the different protocols for how we were gonna collect uh, water from lakes and streams for three different species. We targeted zebra mussels in Northwest Wisconsin, um, Asian clam in South Central Wisconsin, and then New Zealand mud snails in South Central Wisconsin. Um, we just really wanted to refine our methods for how we collect the water in the field and then have extra replicates so that for the state lab to be able to analyze to see which method was going to be most effective. Um, the most exciting thing actually was with the zebra mussels because Jeremy Bates was leading that project and as you all know Jeremy Bates took a job with the National Guard so there was nobody we were just going to drop the zebra mussels from the project but instead I reached out to um, Lisa Burns and uh, Tom Boisvert and I didn't see their names on the call and I was excited to like give them a pat of like an attaboy, um, because we couldn't go up there to show them how to use these peristaltic pumps, how to put it in the water, what they needed to do. Um, so it was all virtually. We Skyped with both of them, um, both myself and the State Lab of Hygiene, and, and they figured it out. They were able to collect the samples for us from lakes in um, <clears throat> Burnett County. Um, so we were able to do that. And then we also tested out drones. Um, on two different species and two different, totally different parts of the state. Um, we work with the DNR aeronautics team. They're through the forestry department. Um, they've got trained pilots who 
go out um, scouting for fires in the spring essentially. So we work with them to fly these drones at different heights to see what's the best height for these different species. We tested the drones um, looking for actually the pennywort in Horicon Marsh. Um, and then Tyler Masalk, who I believe is on the call, um, worked with the, the drone operators to, uh, to monitor for purple loosestrife um, along the Shawamigan Bay kind of area, Northwest Wisconsin. Uh, we also worked with the conservation canines, so the Midwest conservation dogs, whose names have since slightly changed. Um, we wanted to see if the dogs could sniff out New Zealand mud snails, um, which I had been a big skeptic about initially, but we had some samples that we were a little concerned about and the state lab didn't have capacity for any more um, water samples for eDNA. So I contacted the conservation canines and I said, can you guys help us? Like we had sites we wanted to target, but then we didn't even know, can the dogs do it first of all? So we worked with them um, to first see, can they, Dif differentiate New Zealand mud snails from any other macroinvertebrate in, in the streams. Um, the project we're pretty pleased with. There's some more questions yet to answer, um, but I was pleasantly surprised and they were very easy to work with and fun and uh, who doesn't love working with a dog? Um, so what did we learn in 2020? So 2020 was a hard year for everybody. This table looks crazy and I apologize for that. Um, but we did so much and I'm so proud of everybody that we work with. I'll kind of walk you through this table. So we exceeded a thousand monitoring events, which we typically do each year. I'm floored that we were able to do that this year because there were so many challenges for everybody. Um, so how the table is laid out, this first column just is what project. I have the citizen projects listed first, then partners I lumped all the county efforts just into one um, row, um, but I do have all of the data itemized. And then DNR, I lumped all the DNR efforts into one. Um, then the events is the number of field work events. So every time you enter a date with a station um, into SWIMS, it's represented here as one. Um, and then I have the restricted species and prohibited species. Restricted species, we expect to find a lot more prohibited, we expect not to find much. So to break this down a little bit further, um, I differentiated between what the citizens found last year and then what the DNR and partners I lumped together um, found. So we had similar number of field work events between citizens and then the DNR and partners. Um, and then the citizens found 51 restricted species and then the DNR partners lumped together found 123 of the restricted species. Um, citizens this go around didn't find the prohibited species and but the DNR partners found five of them. Um, and I'll show you what some of the significant discoveries were. Um, I've got two slides showing specific species. So in 2020, um, First species I highlight is zebra mussels. We did have three new detections of zebra mussels in the state. All of them were Northeast Wisconsin, so O'Connell, Marinette County. All three were citizen reports, um, not DNR reports. You know, we use those to note net toes. Um, we didn't detect any new zebra mussel through, through our DNR or partner monitoring that collect those toes. It was just citizens looking in the water and seeing that they were there. Um, Next, we have Eurasian water milfoil, which I know it's a ubiquitous restricted species, but it's a lot of people who live on lakes feel very passionately if Eurasian water milfoil um, is first found in their lake. And we did have one new discovery last year and it was actually through Citizen Snapshot Day. Um, so the day where we trained citizens how to identify, you all trained citizens how to identify them on that one day. One citizen in, um, gosh, is it O'Connell County, I think? Um, found Eurasian water milfoil, which is still being followed up on. Um, water lettuce was found in Milwaukee County. Um, a DNR warden worked with the landowner, so it's a private landowner, and they're helping them to control the water lettuce in that in that pound. So that's like a good warning that, hey, it's still out there. People are still, even though it's prohibited, they're still buying it and putting it in their private ponds, and then they inadvertently can get out to surface water. 
Um, then we did find the floating marsh pennywort um, in Horicon Marsh. It was actually reported by the DNR staff that work out at Horicon Marsh. They saw it, they recognized it, and then let us know. Um, Shelby worked with a drone operator, as I mentioned, um, to see, well, how far, how expansive is it? Because you can't go out in a marsh just to look. It's even difficult to get a kayak out around there. But gosh, it was an easy afternoon to meet up with a pilot to fly the drone. He sent us the imagery and, and then we could um, pretty easily see um, which was pennywort versus which wasn't. Um, we also identified graceful cattail um, in Marinette County. That was uh, a pond where, let's see, Amanda Smith, I think you're on the call, um, was doing follow-up surveillance um, given a previously documented prohibited species and then saw a graceful cattail in the same pond. Um, and now she worked with RISC, uh, the Wild Rivers Invasive Species Coalition, to sponsor EDR grant um, for control of that population. Um, we found more butterbur in two different places in the state. Um, both were citizen reports. Um, one was in, let's see, Douglas County. So basically city of Superior, just off the highway. Um, and the other is in Dane County. Um, they're, it, the butterbur is really distinctive, easy to identify, huge leaves. You can see the person's hand in that picture. They're just so big, they're beautiful. It's, really need to see. It's probably planted um, horticulturally. Um, it is a prohibited species, so we are working um, with the counties and SISMAs to control both populations. Um, that was only from 2020. We do have other populations in the state, but not many. Um, we did find prohibitive Phragmites um, in Bayfield County on Lake Owen. The Lake Association already had a, a grant um, for a management plan and control efforts, so they just um, edited their grant so that they can control the populations of the Phragmites that they found on their lakeshore. And then the Japanese stilt grass, which I, I mentioned, it was a citizen report. It was a very, it was a botanist who was out there and she saw it and she knew what it was. And then you saw the group of us had gone out there to see. And we did survey all the proximal streams because there's streams that go right through the property um, and there was none. And forestry is controlling the population. Um, and we're, it's actually in the state forest um, and ex adjacent to an experimental forest. Um, so it gets a, some attention, um, but it's getting a lot of attention from our forestry department right now. Yeah, um, apologize for this slide. So this is just to show you what our efforts have been over time. So from 2015 till 2020, um, I've got three different colored bars. Um, the blue bar, which is the top one, is the number of field work events over time. The orange bar here is the number of restricted species found, and then the red bar at the bottom, that's number of prohibited species. You'll see here, I've got this in years from 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So over a five-year period, um, you'll see there's been variation. A lot of these have to do with if there was a sudden effort to do some kind of roadside surveillance, we found a bunch of Phragmites. That's why you see the increases, decreases, and then we have less effort in 2020, which is expected. Um, so what we found is that citizens, especially in 2020, mind you, like citizens collected about half of the data for AIS monitoring. Um, the citizen programs typically report new AIS during targeted events and incidental observations. Like a lot of the citizens go to the same location, but when citizens are reporting new species, it's during things like snapshot day or if they're just driving around and they've been trained how to identify something else. Um, this encourages me that citizens are fully capable of letting us know if something's new is on the landscape. Um, so we just really wanna encourage people to attend these trainings, provide them um, with ID information as easily as possible and really give them the encouragement that they can indeed um, identify these species. Um, and then I guess just as a, a reminder, we've got the reporting guidance on our webpage and we identify 
who the regional DNRAS coordinator is that you need to let know so that those um, occurrences appear on the DNR mapping website. And this is just a, a list of who, who is where and identified as the regional coordinator. And this is my infamous closing slide, life is easier when you've got a posse. Um, it's kind of a lot of information, different tables and stuff. Do you guys have table or pick qu questions or want me to go back to anything? Maybe I went through that quickly, but I'm sure you don't mind. If you've got a question, just go ahead and unmute and throw it out there. None came in during the, or in the actual chat. Sure. I think you may have explained it so well, they don't have any questions. I guess, yeah. Which well, I was a little confused. Didn't the slide that showed compare the, the numbers for citizens and partners and yeah. show zero citizen prohibited? <laughs> I know, okay. no, and I know that even when I saw that, then I wondered in my head, because this is dated from a few days ago because technically like the Japanese Stilgris was a, a citizen that found it. So that 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 was an error. Sorry, I'm slipping through. So this should technically be one. I mean, the gal that found the Japanese Stilgris was not DNR County. I mean, she was technically a volunteer. So this is bad and I apologize for that. It's okay. Yeah. I to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding something. No. Uh, oh, Chris Hamela asked about the the amount of penny wart found at Horicon. Uh, there's dense. I don't know. Is Shelby on the call? Does she want to speak to it? I don't want to. I mean, she's she done. Was if she still is. I am. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to speak to it, Shelby? Sure. Um. So. It's concentrated um, in the part of Horicon Marsh that is state property. Um, in the DNR Visitor Center, there's a couple of kind of open water impoundments behind that Visitor Center. Um, and as far as we know right now, it's just concentrated in these two little impoundment areas. Um, there's not like public boat, boat access or anything like that, but yeah, there's some dense patches and um, it seems to like to concentrate along the edges of other emergent vegetation like cattails. So it, it doesn't, from our drone imaging, it's not, you know, covering big open water areas, um, but that's, that'll be probably kind of ongoing um, to see if it's in other areas beyond those impoundments, but as far as we know right now, it's just these two areas. Is that another plant used in water gardening? That I, I don't know much about it. I I don't I don't know if either. Um, don't we have another population in Delavan or Walworth County? Yeah, I've seen the one in Delavan. And if, from what I understand about that population is the same thing where it's like in the really shallows but near shore um, where it's going to be a little more protected. Mm -hmm. I would imagine both could come from water gardens. I guess you could do an internet search and see if who's selling it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, don't, I haven't looked at our website on the DNR website to see if it mentions that either. If if a person coordinated it with Shelby or somebody down there, is it something, often I go down kind of in that area to do a little vacation time in the summer, but I'd really be interested in seeing that on the landscape. Is that something I could coordinate? I kind of know the area you're talking about. I've done some training down there, but um, is there an opportunity? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you want to uh, get in contact with me and go out there, I would definitely show you where we're talking about and um, so you can get a look at the plant. It looks pretty similar to some other native species we have. So yeah, it's good to get get an in-person look at it. <laughs> so 
Cool. Thanks. Scott, I'll be in touch. Scott yeah. Frank's asking if, if there's any control efforts possible. And I don't recall with what happened down at Delavan Lake for control. I think Delavan has controlled it, but I think they've, I don't know, it'd be a good, is Sue's on the call? Isn't that Sue's area? No. Or is that, that Heidi? Okay. And Heidi doesn't happen to be here. Call. Yeah, but I believe that they've had con like grants before for the Pennywort population in Delavan. And I don't believe that um, it's been terribly successful, but I also don't, from what I understand, it doesn't, it's not that bad out there, M much like Eurasian water milfoil in most lakes, that it's something, it's a new species that's present um, and it kind of pops up around the lake, but I don't think it's become a problem, but I don't have direct experience with it. Mm. From what we saw in um, Horicon, it didn't seem overly concerning. It seemed that there were denser areas than in some places than others, but it didn't seem to be terribly problematic, but you don't want to base that on just a subjective comment. Yeah, something to keep an eye on and learn more about, especially yeah. if you see it more. Well, that brings us right up to break time. So thank you, Maureen. Um, we're going to just take 10. And then when we come back, we're going to have some partner projects uh, reporting. So see everybody about 1030. is going to, I'll start that again. Stephanie in um, Oneida County is going to kick us off on a partner projects with volunteers section. And we've got about five minutes more than originally planned in case the four of you didn't happen to hear earlier. But when it comes time to, uh, when, I, when you hit 10 minutes, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to just put a little star like that somewhere on your screen, just to let you know you're at 10 and so that you can get to your wrap up time and, and then our goal is to have uh, five or more questions, five or more minutes left for questions. But I gotta quit talking so you can get going. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hello, everybody. I'm going to tell you about a really special program that was developed uh, 10 years ago by our um, then uh, aquatic invasive species coordinator, Michelle Sadaskis. Um, so Michelle had decided a great way to teach uh, our youth about invasive species at that time, aquatic invasive species, was to have them participate in a poster contest. And so that contest started 10 years ago as the Northwoods Aquatic Invasive Species Poster Contest. And since then, we have expanded our uh, contest to include not just aquatic invasives, but also terrestrial invasives and wetland invasives. And then two years ago, we opened the doors to every student grades fourth through eighth grade in Wisconsin. And that includes homeschool, parochial school, public school students. Um, and we encourage all students to get involved and a large component of um, the involvement throughout the state is getting a conservation specialist or an AIS coordinator, maybe one of you, into the classrooms of your county and help teach these kids about invasive species and help uh, get them prepped for our poster contest. So the first year began as, um, like I said, 2012, and we received 82 posters. Um, and we have grown since then just by leaps and bounds. So as you can see here, we've got over 2,993 posters that have been submitted since that first year. So I'm really proud of our um, accomplishments. Last year, our numbers were down a lot because of COVID, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But right here, I've made a collage of some of my favorite posters. Um, it's been a lot of fun because some of these students have um, siblings that might be in fourth grade and another sibling that's in eighth grade or sixth grade or seventh grade, and they get quite competitive against each other. And we find that um, classrooms get competitive against uh, other classrooms. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun to see all of this competitiveness going on. And in the process, the students are learning more and more about invasives and, and they're getting more creative with their posters as well. So I should go back and say also that 
the poster contest, we need to have, um, uh, we need to make sure that spelling is correct and that it encompasses some sort of a species that is known to impact Wisconsin's lands and waters and wetlands. So this is just a little advertisement here for this year's uh, poster contest. Um, and we encourage kids to take the challenge and get creative, uh, make it an actual piece of artwork that also combines science with it um, and biology. Um, and, and we now also encourage them to create a catchy slogan. Um, and then this will help raise awareness about invasive species throughout their whole community because the students go home and tell their parents and grandparents about what's going on and and they think it's really cool and then a lot of um, counties um, do a lot of um, public service announcements through their newspapers and uh, TV um, local TV stations so we get quite a wide range of advertisement for this whole poster contest um, so this year uh, poster entries must be received by Wednesday, April 28th at four o'clock in our office. Um, we have several drop-off locations throughout the North Woods that um, are our local libraries. So our public libraries, we've uh, been in contact with them each year and they do not mind being a drop-off location for either an individual student's or a whole classroom's posters. And then from those drop-off locations, we'll have a county conservationist in that area or myself or whoever is closest to that area go to that library and pick up all the posters and bring them back. We also have uh, classes that actually mail their posters to us. And then last year because of COVID we had to make quite a lot of changes and really sit and figure out how are we going to make this work and we just determined the best way to make it work was to have the students take a picture of their poster and email it to us. And so that worked quite well. And that way um, they could still participate from home. The teachers could still be involved with helping the students with their posters as well. Um, so the poster contest is fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And as you can see, we have the division of seventh and eighth grade combined. And the reason we do that is because there's not a whole lot of seventh and eighth graders that tend to participate in the contest. But we do give, um, a trophy, as you can see there, to the first, second, and third place winners of each division. And we have honorable mention and best slogan ribbon, ribbons, as well as best of show ribbons. Um, so each first place winner's classroom is a winner as well. So uh, we go into that first place winner's classroom and give that whole classroom a party. So I'll bring cupcakes and their trophies and ribbons and whatever with. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, and then each first place winner's library receives a field guide. Um, sometimes it's one of Paul's books, other times it's about Wisconsin streams and, and rivers um, or whatever else we can find that might be new on the market that year that would be a nice fit for that school's library. So it's not just about an individual student winning, it's also about the entire classroom winning. Oh, and also teachers have an uh, opportunity to win a gift card too. Um, so to get the kids prepared for this, in Oneida County, I go into the schools. Um, I go into almost every classroom and visit um, the students, and that is usually done the month of March. Um, and I take in all of my hands-on stuff, all the fun stuff, get them learning about invasives. Um, mostly aquatic is what I'm teaching, but I do touch on some terrestrial as well. Um, I always take um, Andy's popular um, Milfoil Man video, and that's one of the first things that I show when I'm in the classroom. That's such a big hit. I really encourage you guys to show that uh, video. Um, if you haven't seen it already, it's a total hoot. Um, so then as far as judging, once we receive all the posters, we have um, a panel of judges that come in. Um, typically there's three judges, sometimes we have four and we make a whole morning of it. Um, and then um, um, I'll show you right here. This is, this is one of our judges here. So what we do is we, we take a week between the time the posters come in and the time of judging, and we, we post all of these posters on the walls of the courthouse. So the whole second floor, floor of the courthouse is plastered with posters. We use a little sticky putty type of a, 
uh, substance to put on the back of the posters so that we don't have to use tape. Um, my um, um, office administrator, she makes a label for each one of the posters so you can see down at the bottom of the posters, each student's uh, poster has a little label there that identifies the posters. We don't put the students' names anywhere on the poster or anywhere on the labels. They're, so they're all category, um, categorized by their grades and classes, and they are all assigned a number like A1 or AB or whatever it is. So this is one of our judges, Marsha. And this is Michelle, and a lot of you know Sandy Wickman and Tracy Beckman. She might be here in the crowd today, too. Um, we're just going over the rules with the judges, what to look for. Spelling is always the number one thing we have to catch, is spelling, 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 because there's been times when we've had a really great poster that we wanted to give um, a first place or a second place or a third place to, but there might be something wrong with the spelling that is off that we have to then make that poster um, uh, honorable mention. Here's some more posters. And then after we have all of the winners, we notify the classrooms and that's when we go into the classrooms to present their trophies um, and ribbons and bring some treats and then also their prize for the library as well. Um, we get a lot of students that like to tour the courthouse afterwards to see their posters actually on the walls of the courthouse. The posters are left um, on the wall through the month of June and that um, allows us to celebrate um, or that's one of the things I, that we do to celebrate Invasive Species Awareness, Awareness Month. Um, I wanted to include this here. This is a look, uh, a list of the books that we've distributed over the years to the school's library. Um, so we've got a lot of uh, fun books there. Um, the Field Guide to Wisconsin Streams, Aquatic Plants of the Upper Midwest, um, are probably two of our main books that we use, but we also have to keep track of what libraries are receive what book because we often have the same library year after year receiving a book. And then um, to help the parents and the students and the teachers get ready, we have a really nice poster contest brochure um, on our website. And this is just some pictures of it here that goes on and explains um, all about the poster contest, resources, it has the um, drop-off locations listed, and it has the actual entry form on, um, the, um, on the brochure as well. So, and, oh, I just wanted to share this here with you too. Best, whoops, best slogans, let me go back. Whoops, I guess I can't. Um, anyway, there's a list of some of our best slogans. This here, I'm just going to share with you real quickly some of our um, posters that we received over the last couple of years that have won some trophies. Really nice and colorful. We encourage the kids to make them colorful and, and make it edge to edge as well. Some of these are absolutely hilarious. That's all I've got. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So um, I'm going to talk about garlic mustard um, and the collaborative work that we do with um, partners mostly. Uh, we try to get volunteers, but we um, mostly have partners and student groups that help with garlic mustard. Um, so uh, garlic mustard isn't technically a wetland species. Our largest sites are along floodplains, though, and many AIS departments, I, I know, help with control. Um, if you don't know that much about garlic mustard, it is a biennial species. It bolts and flowers in the early spring, and hand pulling before it develops seeds is an effective treatment. Um, plants are easy to pull and in some nice habitats, and they're not toxic, so it's great to get help um, with volunteers um, and students of all ages. The, the um, sites that I'm going to focus on, we have 47 known sites in our region, um, but we work and we work to treat all of them with partners. Uh, I'll be discussing the work on the Bad River 
um, floodplain in Mellon, and then along the Montreal River uh, in Hurley. Um, the garlic mustard along the Bad River floodplain extends 200 acres, and um, the area furthest upstream is treated by the Shaquamakin Nicolet National Forest, and there's a large area that is not treated um, that follows the Bad River, and the, the NCWMA treats 70 acres that's in the red hashes here uh, by hand pulling in the spring, um, and Glyphoic also treats it with herbicide in the fall. Uh, when the native plants are dormant, and we work to prevent it from spreading downstream to Copper Falls State Park and the Bad Res River Reservation. Um, the Bad River infestation was found in 2007, and groups have been hand pulling since that time um, on all 70 acres downstream, um, or the furthest downstream. We do not have a lot of volunteers, as I said, um, because we don't have like lake associations. So it is difficult to get volunteers, but uh, we have uh, partners that all come together and then we try to get school groups to come to and So they make the majority of the hand pulling or do the most hand pulling. Uh, we have a week long event each year along the Bad River. And one of the days we invite school groups and typically pre COVID, we would have a free cookout for all who came to help. Um, Glyphwick in particular has people work daily. They survey, map, and flag patches across the area each year. Um, and it is worth, all, all, is it worth all this manual work? Uh, the NCWMA created 25 random plots through the 70 acres, and these have been monitored for five different years. The monitoring started after treatment had been going for five years or so. So we do not have a complete picture of how the treatments have worked. Uh, we do know that the garlic mustard was much denser when it was first discovered. The blue bars show that since 2013, the percent of plots with garlic mustard present has been slightly lower the last few years. Overall, garlic mustard occurs across the same area. One patch was found last year downstream. Um, the percent of plots with garlic mustard cover over 5% has been low the last three years. Um, most plots have only a few plants present actually. So it's much lower than 5% a lot of the times in most of those plots. Um, and with the garlic mu mustard cover low, the native plant diversity and quality seems to have stayed intact. Uh, when each native and invasive species is inventoried in the plots and their cover is estimated, um, the DNR's floristic quality assessment calculator suggests a good quality community with an FQI of 32 and a good plant quality, community quality would be um, between 20 and 35. So it's a very high quality habitat. And I'm now gonna shift to the work along the Montreal River. Um, this is smaller, but it is still a large site with 47 acres. Um, this was discovered in 2010 and I have broken the site into three regions. Um, so region one is north of Highway 2 in Wisconsin and it's about 13 acres. Region two is south of Highway 2 in Wisconsin. And then region three is in Michigan, um, the whole area in Michigan, so east of the Montreal River. So in region one, that's where we have focused our efforts on hand pulling the garlic mustard and we don't have many volunteers. Occasionally we get some uh, master gardeners. Um, but many of the partner groups come together and we have a seventh grade from the Hurley School that assists each year, which is about 47 or 45 students. Uh, one teacher who has just recently retired would help a lot, uh, that's Diane O'Cronley, and um, would bring the students out. Um, and we would usually with the partners work for about two full days. Um, and we've been working on treating the whole of Wisconsin side in the last three years. So for an example, here's one plot in the cover of the garlic mustard was determined soon after it was discovered with 90% cover in 2012. And last year it had the same, at the same exact spot, the cover was 1%. And this is somewhat representative of the area. Most of the garlic mustard is not dense um, in region one. In region two, we don't really have comparable plots. Um, it is, it has had inconsistent treatments and has many invasives and few natives and very poor soil. So um, some of the areas are just rock. So we have been trying to hand pull this recently, but it did have herbicide treatments also. 
In region three, which is in Michigan, um, I have a few plots in region one to three to show. Uh, this region had annual herbicide treatments, although they tended to be late in the spring. There was no hand pulling in this area at all. And this plot had high garlic mustard covered in 2012 and quite high cover in 2020 also. Um, another sample plot in the region three, um, it had high garlic mustard cover in 2012 and not in 2020, but it is in the area that tends to have pooling water. Since this is on the flood plain, there is um, flooding quite often and there are areas that might be affected by pooling water. Uh, so the absence of garlic mustard may be more of a factor of the pooling water as it's not far from this plot that it is very dense. Um, so this area is just closer to the water actually. It's actually the largest um, um, garlic mustard patch I've ever seen. <laughs> so this graph shows a quick breakdown of the garlic mustard in the different regions. The blue bars show that over half of all plots have garlic mustard present. Um, however, in region one, there were no plots with garlic mustard, at least in 2020, um, over 5%. And I have similar information about region one that it kind of was higher um, since 2013 when they first start, started taking it. But um, in 2020, there were no plots that were over 5%. And in the other two regions, um, there are, it's 40% of the plots had over 5% cover. And many of these have very high cover. In fact, the ones that do have over 5% cover. And the vegetation in region one where it was hand pulled annually is much better from looking at the plots in 2020 than in region two or three. The quality is not as good along the Bad River as in the Bad River floodplain, but it is still within the good range. So with 26, um, from this calculation, the index is very low in both region two and three. Um, so it's very poor quality vegetation. So we don't know that that's from the herbicide treatments, but it kind of suggests that it could be. So um, from you know the work that we've done along the Bad River and the Montreal River, I think it's really good to put a lot of effort into doing manual labor sometimes. It brings people together, uh, teaches about the invasive species control and can be the best option for the environment. So um, that is all I have. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Nice. Thank you. I got to go visit when I went up and visited a couple years ago. I was out on the Montreal River part with Zach, and it was amazing. The spring ephemerals are so, so beautiful. Um, next up, we have Zach. <laughs> Zach Wilson talking about the um, turtle flambeau purple loose stripe work that they do. It looks like he is working through the, the screen sharing process here. It helps to unmute before you share your screen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm uh, so uh, proud of uh, the work Ramona's doing. She's doing a great job. It's a great success story. So thanks for that, Ramona. Um, yes, and also thanks, Jeannie, for in, uh, inviting me to share this story. Um, it's a pretty neat story. It actually predates my time here at the Land and Water Conservation Department. The project has been in existence for about 10 years. And uh, for those of you that know Iron County, we, we're so fortunate we have some beautifully intact natural resources. And the Turtle Flamble Flowage Scenic Waters area is one of those. Uh, Governor uh, Tommy Thompson uh, designated and called it the, the jewel of the crown jewel of Wisconsin. Um, but we filled up last year due to COVID and all the tourism. So don't come here anymore, please. Um, so uh, just a quick little share of some of our purple loose start projects. Uh, we're a small 
County and we are, believe it or not, have an opportunity to kind of tackle purple loosestrife. And I know in some places it's just beyond um, imaginable to try to think about controlling it. But I literally go to just about every purple loosestrife uh, identify location in the county and administer some kind of management or control to it. Um, and, you know, here the purple is some of the uh, uh, dots of, of where we have identified purple loosestrife. And you can see down here on the bottom of the county, we have uh, a lot of color uh, around the turtle farm of Fort Ridge. Uh, we do um, gather, collect, and raise uh, the beetles and we uh, distribute them throughout the county in different places. So that is a program that we continue each year, but I mostly focus the beetles on places that I cannot physically get to. And that would be really uh, boggy uh, uh, wetland locations that are just very difficult to get to. Um, and we have, unfortunately have one really bad site uh, in the county and it's in the middle of the forest and a big wetland on it. Not even sure how purple blue stripe ever got there. Um, but that is our beetle rearing location. So that's kind of a good thing. Um, and and I, I tried to make a little bit of a flow chart here to show how I work with the Turtle Flammable Flowage uh, Property Owners Association and how we kind of organize this volunteer effort down on the flowage itself. And uh, I'm super fortunate that the association has uh, a subcommittee for invasive species. They also have a subcommittee for water quality that I work with as well. So I have a, a kind of a, uh, a partner with the AIS coordinator for the association itself. And that person, it does change hands every couple years, but that person helps identify and, and has a more up-to-date list of active paid members and folks that are interested in participating in some of our workshops or some of our management um, training events. And so that person I work with directly and then he or she then distributes information to uh, folks that are interested for the association. And at the same time, I then coordinate uh, with our other partners and the DNR has been just excellent. Uh, the DNR wildlife staff, the DNR fisheries staff, uh, the DNR uh, property management um, manager and their staff, as well as occasionally the uh, state natural area manager, Ryan McGanna comes in. Um, and so we have this really neat cooperative partnership. Last year during COVID, difficult year, uh, we were able to get 12 individuals from the association that put in over 90 hours of volunteer work. And uh, the paid staff, DNR and county, uh, did seven full days of uh, purple loose type work on the turtle flammable flowage. So a really neat partnership across different agencies. And so how do we, how do, we do it? Um, because the turtle flammable foliage is 14,000 acres of water, uh, over 100 miles of shoreline, lots of islands, 192 islands. And so this is a difficult place to monitor. Um, and what we did was we divided the flowage into areas. So you can see this map on the left. We have area one, two, three, and so forth. And uh, what we do is then we would assign volunteers or volunteers would sign up to monitor that particular area. And while they're out there monitoring that area, I provided a data sheet that they can fill out providing the lat longs, number of plants, um, if they've seen any uh, beetle activity, and then if there's any control activity or methods associated with it. And then that information comes back to me uh, sometime late July, early August, and I, I enter that into a GIS network and then produce a map that we can then follow up and do some control work. So those, those folks are just out there monitoring, looking for purple loose stripe. Um, we did provide a letter to the volunteers, just kind of helping them, um, on, 
guide them on what to do if they did find a, a purple strike plant. And there's a couple options here. Um, one one um, direction is if you found one plant, don't just flag it and mark it and tell us about it. Pull it, um, bag it, and we kind of have instruction on how to do that safely. But if it was a large population, just too much for one person to handle, uh, we have a method of flagging it and marking it and kind of documenting its size and abundance so that we could do follow-up management on that. And then we have a fun work day where we all get together and obviously this is pre-COVID. Uh, last year it was uh, masked and distance and a lot less volunteers. Um, but we have a fun day where we all get together and we kind of figure out a, a strategy and we assign boats and folks to certain units um, that they would either hand pull or uh, we do have folks that are certified uh, for herbicide if need be. And so we have a fun partnership day, a workday event. Sometimes it lasts a couple days um, and we do trainings at this uh, opportunity. We provide all the equipment that they're uh, that they need and we meet up for lunch discuss some things and then we take the uh, bags of purple loose truck if they were cold um again it's a great day to go out and enjoy the beautiful turtle flammable foliage um it was fun this year we we added a, a additional a piece of data and that was looking for loon chicks while they're out there so a, a cooperative partnership with the wildlife and um, at the end, we uh, gather all these bags and we cook them on the blacktop and we uh, throw them away in dumpsters pro provided by the DNR. So a great partnership. Um, one of the AIS coordinators uh, for the association, we worked together with like a Google Maps program and we were able to kind of put this together and share it. So folks in the field could use this phone, their phones to follow them to these high concentrated areas. And so you can see some of the work we've done uh, throughout the, the season there. And just quickly, uh, I have a few maps highlighting each year and how we can identify hot spots and areas is where we maybe need to adjust our management and control. And if we combine them all, you can see some of our problem areas. This is the inlet of the Turtle River, and this is the inlet of the uh, Flambo River, um, which is the source of probably most of the Purple Loose Tribe. And all of this combined then really helps us put a good management strategy together to determine whether or not we want to use herbicide or maybe it's a better place for rearing beetles. So uh, a great uh, partnership and a really a fun and successful project. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you. And I'm not worried about the time. We're keeping on rolling here. Zach, that's my favorite picture of you. I use it all the time for things. <laughs> um, and, you might even no, you're not in this presentation I'm doing today. So next up we have Matt Walrath. He's going to talk about the project he's working on for AIS signage management with his volunteers. All right. You should see my screen all right. I do. Remarkable. Okay. Um, hey, welcome. My name's Matt. I work with the Upper Sugar River Watershed Association. And I got some similar ideas to Zach as far as how uh, some of this stuff happens too, but you all will recognize from your boat landings, these signs. It's part of all of our core agreements. It's a really important part of our work. So I'm going to walk through a little bit about how we do this down here in the Dane County area. I'm also interested to hear what techniques y'all might be able to share with me for how you do this. So uh, a reminder that um, signage is our front line. If you've seen those things out in the field that say signs never stop, outdoor advertising works, it's true. Winter, spring, summer, or fall, uh, these are out there doing our work for us. So that prompt's super important. 
you'll notice that there's lots of different signs as we flash through all these different slides. There's a million out there. So another reason to make sure that you have the right stuff ready to go for your volunteers, get the right signs from Tim Campbell. He's often the lead for that stuff and Jeannie does that work too. So they can get you more signs if you need them. This is one of our uh, one of our star volunteers, Bill Keen, here in the middle, uh, with the with the brush station. So we're in New Zealand mud snail territory. So especially important for us to remind folks to clean their boats off, going into the water, coming out of the water, and and use this extra tool for our waiting anglers to get uh, those little hitchhikers off their boots, off their gear, to the best of their abilities. So. It could be a bit daunting when you first sit down with your county and you say, wow, um, geez, these things have to be everywhere, right? Uh, and so boat landings, if as a reminder, if you're new to the program, they, they really want them to be facing usually towards the water, but I often will kind of over sign a place. I'd rather have more signs than less signs uh, within a reason. Always get permission first from your landowners, or it's often just as simple as checking in with the Wisconsin DNR and whoever runs that park or that spice being like, hey, can we um, get another sign out there? But then they're gonna have ideas as far as where you want to um, put that at the landing so they're not blocking their, their work. Uh, and you'll notice there's actually, this work happens all around the region and we have our stop aquatic hitchhikers. So this is actually from Michigan. So similar work in different places. But if you have, 100, 200 different boat landings, you might want to be a volunteer wrangler. As much fun as it would be to drive around all those boat landings, not always the best use of your time. Uh, this is actually my dad on the left during COVID as we look at some uh, some shotgun holes or some some rifle holes in a, in a sign. And this is a bunch of uh, Boy Scouts and Eagle Scouts that we've had great success with in our time. So if you're creative and you have a good ask, you can do a lot of this work with volunteers. And that's what we have a very strong volunteer program down at Upper Sugar, a great core group of people and people always asking us to do stuff. So we keep them busy. We almost have a waiting list of people that do stuff for us. Getting into the brass tacks uh, of how uh, I do this planning and coordinating with my volunteers, you want to be organized, right? So um, also waivers, uh, always a volunteer reminder get a nice uh, blanket waiver that your legal team agrees with and have people sign up for that before they're doing any work with uh, power tools or driving around. So don't skip that step, could really save you down the road. Preaching to the choir, but I love the surface water data viewer. And if this is the base level in, in this layer, I'm showing all the, all the, it's boat accesses and fishing. It's one of the tabs you can pick in your show layers area over here. Uh, if you put in surface water data viewer, uh, Wisconsin DNR, you'll find this page and it's just a great resource. So what I'm doing in this case is I'm I'm looking at all this, and this is kind of the territory that I generally run with um, from Dane County to the Mississippi and a bit to the north, a bit to the south. So that's a lot of signs. There's a lot of stuff out there. And what I want to zoom in on is there's a couple different ways to do this um, as far as getting a list of stuff, but you want to get a nice list for your volunteers. So we go to the Lakes and AAS viewer here, and we can see uh, a spot where we can have all of our in swims, if there's a sign that's going to appear that you want to look at, um, they sh you should be able to see it on this. Now, you don't always. So this is something that you're going to want to work with your, your um, AIS coordinator to make sure that there is a correctly set up ROI record of interest for each sign spot. Um, the more we can get that synced up with what swim says and what the data viewer shows, first of all, it's really satisfying for a volunteer to be able to go online and see that their work appears on a map. I'll say that across the board getting stuff verified and getting uh, people's progress viewable so they can brag to their grandkids or whatever just helps with your program. Um, and also it's, I think, useful for transition and the whole idea of uh, getting people out there with knowledge. So what I do is I, I take this and I kind of, I'll go into swims and I'll pull a list of landing sites or sign sites for different counties, or sometimes I'll use the data viewer. And I put that right into what Zach was talking about. Use, I use Google Maps uh, as a great volunteer tool. So what I'm going to do is we're going to do a mirror match here and watch as suddenly like magic at Google Maps appears. So I'm looking at waiter wash stations that we've installed that I want to do maintenance on. 
so I can get a plan for a volunteer. I can't just give them this map and say, hey, drive around. I mean, I could, but that's not really great volunteer management. So bam, now we've got all of our waiter wash stations. Each little pin is a live pin in Google Maps, and they tend to be pretty easy to use for volunteers. You can pull that right up on your phone. Um, they can actually edit some of the directions themselves kind of as an overlay in their in their mobile device if they use that, or they could print it out if they like that. You can get detailed directions. So what I'm doing here is, you know, it's you kind of make a, you can import this as a layer into Google Maps, and I'm not going to do a full demo of how to do Google Maps right now, but it's in the Your Places uh, area of Maps. So if you click through Your Places on the left-hand side of it, you can find a way to um, create maps and then import Excel sheets or whatever else it is that has lat longs, and they'll put pins down there. It takes a bit of, of finessing, but it's actually a lot easier than, like, say, using um, ArcGIS to do this kind of stuff. Shout out to Mount Horeb. That's where we're based out of. So you kind of see that we have a core of these signs that appear right around our area. And what does this look like for our volunteer user when they're actually poking it around? Uh, they're going to go to, they find what's saved, or, or if I share with them, this is how it looks. You got your saved area, and then you got your Google Maps. Click on this, and you're going to see. So what's actually neat about this is that your layer, you can add a directions uh a layer to it so say hey i need you to hit these six spots and here is your outlined uh even sometimes offline uh route map so that you can make sure you're not wasting your volunteers time be as efficient as possible with how they, they're they going to roll around uh your counties and your landings to do that kind of stuff um that goes for both doing installations, doing checks, and of course, maintenance. So other tool that we use is, um, we use Google quite often at my association. So this is a, a Google Drive document that our um, one of our Eagle Scouts made for us. So by having this, we have this long-term record that I can then shoot this back out to another volunteer to go do, do checks. It's got lat longs, it has the name of the stuff. There's actually a bunch more columns off to the right here. Just organized in that way, uh, you have a running log of, of when you visited that site, when you've had a volunteer out there last, what they said. You want to make a nice data sheet. I didn't show it because it's not the most attractive thing to look at slides. But if you look at the SWIMS form or what they ask you for, presence, absence, was it facing there? What time were they at? What kind of sign was it? And in fact, you might even, I, I always have them take pictures. I've just got a folder full of pictures of signs and where they're at out in the uh, out in the landscape so that I can reference them. So um, and sometimes I'll even double up signs. Sometimes with old signs, there's one out there or there's a waiter wash station out there, but I actually want to have the prompt, the full stop aquatic hitchhiker sign just right at the landing versus, so, you know, get permission, but I don't, I think I'd rather be safe than sorry, as long as you're not blocking traffic or maintenance work, um, for that, that the park has to do or the, whatever the land owner needs, get some signs out there to remind people uh, it's a branding thing. It takes a long-term, uh, idea. So maintenance plans it that's also when you install signs volunteers for maintenance because it's gonna be a lot of work and can be a pushback we're talking about new signs for a bunch of upland sites so put maintenance into your volunteer planning so that they can take that off your plate for you so you want to recruit um it can be a bit confusing there's lots of stuff out there as far as uh you know ways to get this done we've had great luck and i'm actually curious what everyone else uses but um so i found um well, we have a great core for tired volunteers. And this guy is, shout out to my, my guy, Mark. He's not on the call. Uh, he doesn't like the internet that much, but Mark is an old, po uh, he's a steam fitter, a retired steam fitter. So when I, when I give him a job, I'm like, all right, Mark, here's the job. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how to do this because you know how to do this way better than I do. Um, here's the, here's your hardware. I'll see you in a week. And he's like, so on it. He's just so, he's way better at this stuff than I am. So I'm just blessed to have him. So here's us stalling an, another um, another waste, uh, waiter wash station out at uh, Love Creek where there's a big New Zealand mud snail infestation. Other thing we've had great luck with is if you get poked by your Eagle Scouts, they want to build something. They need to build something. They need deliverables. And so Eagle Scouts will just crank out a bunch of signs for you. And it's pretty fun. You saw that first shot with the Eagle, with the Boy Scouts uh, helping out with masks. And this is uh, Christopher Lofts was our guy who did this. And that's not actually him, but this is his buddy. Um, so, uh, they need those deliverables. Um, now you ask actually how much would it cost to do this? And, you know, you want to plan, uh, all these various components. The signs are free. The scrushers, the, the boot brushers <coughs> are usually 
provided by DNR, if you ask nicely. Um, but these stations come out to be about like 60 to 100 bucks of lumber materials, depending upon what you use and if you buy in bulk and all that, if you're efficient with your cuts. Um, so how is about you? That's what I'm curious. What, what did I miss? What do you uh, all use to uh, get this work done with your volunteers? So I'm interested to see our discussion. And uh, thanks for the time. All righty. Um, okay, so we're pretty far out of, out of whack on timing, but I think these were super important to share. And um, if anybody doesn't have, um, a, a, that's not what I want to say. Does anybody have a question that we didn't already take care of in chat? If so, let's just take two minutes to do that. Oh, Kathy's got a good one about um, getting getting new sites updated into data in the surface water data viewer and remove. Um, contact me and Jake Dickman, and we can get that worked out. If you if you have like you you're going to put in an, a sign in a place that has not had one, it's not showing up the viewer, or you discover there's one just not there. There's probably a little glitch going on in, in swims. Um, which is pretty easy to, to fix. I've helped with that before. Um, and if something needs to be removed, we can, we can take care of that too. And then um, we do have a variety of signage types. So we have stream access, the boat launch, the cleaning stations, um, signs for waterfowl, as well as for um, just general angler signs. So, oh, Tom, if you happen to have just shared my signage document, that would be great. <laughs> um, oh, good. Tom showed some, this is excellent. Good stuff going on in there, Tom sharing. But it, we do have everything in, um, in box. You can always ask me. We have a guide. But do not use the DNR website. It is not updated at this point. It's... Um, there's, it has to be done by a contractor and with COVID and everything, it's just way behind on getting that update. So it's best to come direct to me with any questions. I can send you the guide. Um, and we do have AIS signage as the topic of one of the Small Bites trainings because there's also a reporting form we started using. Ah, thank you. Tim's just sharing the box folder. So if that's our last question, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into my presentation. Good note too, actually, is that now Jeannie is the lead, not Tim. I, I misspoke on that since that's shifted. That was also in the chat. So bug Jeannie, not Tim about this stuff, though Tim is a great <laughs> resource for um, branding and all that kind of stuff. Last thing I forgot to mention is if you do use Eagle Scouts, they are not allowed to work on permissions with you. So get your permissions first. I found that out uh, by looking through their bylaws. So permissions are not a part of their project. Oh, interesting. Thank you. All right. Yeah, because I know that comes up all the time. So I'm going to try and talk fast because we want to leave time for our discussion of, that Tim's going to run. But um, I've been, a lot of you are already aware, maybe all of you are already aware that we've been having a partnership the last couple of years with Melinda Myers, who is a gardening expert, former extension uh, educator, and we are continuing our work with her this year. So I'm just going to give you an update on what's going on with that, along with an overview of what the program's been. So we've mentioned plants several times today that could have found their start in a water garden or some other kind of wet garden and ended up out on the landscape where we certainly don't need to have it and where it can cause significant problems. So, um, and it seems like almost every year we have at least one or two things pop up. They might not be as straight up aquatic like the water lettuce, but there's always seems to be something that's escaped from somebody's garden, terrestrial and aquatic and wetland. So um, these are examples of right here in Wisconsin over the last several years of the butterbur, the uh, uh, Koi and goldfish show up all the time. Birds love them though, so they do help. We have some natural biocontrol going on. 
um, I, this picture of her looking so sad at the water hyacinth <laughs> always cracks me up. And then, of course, we've been dealing um, in a couple different locations with the yellow floating heart, which has actually been found in private ponds. And um, these, the folks that have had it have been getting help directly with DNR to get it managed, which is super. So we understand the impacts of this because we've dealt with it. You know, there's Tom out there helping Chris AC and getting water hyacinth out of uh, out of well, is that Lake Winnicone, I think, where you guys were going. Um, and we've had it in the Mississippi and other areas. That that koi, the reason it's a problem, it carries a carp killing virus, the koi virus. I got to experience that one firsthand because I live on the Crawfish River and a couple of, well, it was probably about five years ago now, it got into Horicon Marsh because someone had released goldfish, the carp got sick, and that summer, once the temperature reached certain temperature, certain heights of temperature, carp started dying all the way down the Rock River and it, they were coming up the tributary and then dying also. So we had so many dead carp out in front of our um, area where my son likes to go down and fish that he said, meh, not this year. And then lots of times this kind of control needs to happen year after year or management or just looking because of the things that are able to continue or keep popping up. Maybe releases are still happening, and it could also be things like flooding could be moving some of this stuff. And we're seeing more of that in different parts of the country or the state. So I had an idea about three years ago now to get someone who could first initially talk to water gardens who they could relate to. So this is using the whole trusted messenger type of idea, the same thing, reason we go to bait shops to provide them information because they're trusted man messengers for the anglers. Um, same reason we have a couple of radio spots for a drain campaign about, um, you know, the fish. There's by a, couple, a fisherman and a, and a fishing chef that we have to share, things like that. So Although now you're more likely to hear them called social influencers. So Melinda has been our social influencer to water gardeners for the last couple of years. And she, her, her experience is just so, so vastly well known in the state by gardeners. Um, and the long list of things she does there. And she's also a trusted or a, a spokesperson for American Transmission Company. And if you've seen the Growth Smart campaign, that's about not planting things that are gonna go tall directly under power lines. So her reach is really, really wide. And she comes with a team. Diana handles the business side of things and helps make sure she keeps Diana and sometimes me on track now too, because I have to you know, be in, um, contact and be in the loop to keep things rolling. And then Dawn does her work with uh, video and photography and putting it all together and giving it a wonderful professional look. So um, I actually went to the Madison Garden Show after I had this idea about three years ago and I knew Melinda was always there and happened to walk in the door just as she was setting up. Her table was just a few feet from the main door, right where you could easily find it, and asked her if she'd be interested in helping us out. And she said, absolutely, and gave me the contact information for her and Diana. So she was thrilled because working in, on getting invasives off the landscape fits in really, really well with her messaging. She also pushes a lot of use of native plants for restoration. Um, and her extension, uh, her education background really shows up. I've had the opportunity to sit through a few of the webinars that she's been doing, uh, really got rolling on during the pandemic. And 
she will do an hour or so presentation and stay on for as much as two hours answering questions. So um, on my side, besides helping to decide what we need from year to year, I help by providing talking points. And then everybody's been helping in one way or the other provide photos. Um, and I hope you'll continue to do so because of course her invasive species photo library is not as big as her um, other plant library. And then they promote through their networks as, as I do through reaching out to you to promote. And then um, I've worked with the UW-Madison Extension staff to house some of the videos that we've made. So we've got some changes this year. The biggest one is we're expanding from water gardens to just get out to everybody that has wet feet because of their gardening. So that could be a rain gardener or a shoreline gardener. We're all dealing with aggressive and invasive plants. So the twist of the aggressive plants is something that gardeners can really relate to because any of us who garden know things like Creeping Charlie. If you've got wetland or you're doing a shoreline garden, you know, and you're right up to the edge, you got a risk of cattails. So it's a way in the door to also introduce and talk about the invasive plants. So that's another change in the focus. We've already done these four videos and I've got um, links. I, I see the chat numbers going up. So Tim might be sharing a link to one of them there. And I have all of these links for this inbox and I'll, I need to send them out again anyway so you can get the spring one out to share with folks. So I will be doing that. There, there's one long one and the rest are just like a minute or so long. And they're also seasonal, they, they match up so you can do them over the course of the year. She's been writing articles for us and what she'll do is she'll put the article together. I've shared a couple with the Lake Tides and then she sends them out to a really extensive um, list of her own partners and or not partners, but people she reaches out to in garden clubs, master gardeners, and Wisconsin publications around the state. And then you are also welcome to share those. And like I did, I shared them for you guys uh, about two weeks ago now. And then she has an, her own newsletter that she has incorporated, like these two um, included articles about the videos. And then social media. And all of this is going directly to the gardeners. She's a person they know and trust and they're getting the messaging from her, which makes it strong. And once she's in person again, she'll be back at the garden shows and at the state fair. She might even be at the state fair this year. That's actually, having been there a few times, looks like that's actually at the Alliance Center where she's talking to some folks. And she, she has some of our brochures and um, a couple of banners and things that she'll have up at all those events. And the big one coming up, Next for our partnership is she's going to be doing this webinar at 6.30 on May 12th. So um, those are also links I gave Tim to post. So they're probably in there. I just can't see them. But go ahead and share those. Get those out there. She has, can have up to 1,000 people at the, um, at the Zoom webinars. She went ahead and sprung for the, the big, big audience. And... Um, Two days ago, they had 139 people signed up already so far, and this has only been out for not that long. So go ahead and spread the word. Um, the one article that was already out was about avoiding aggressive and invasive species. The one in May, she's also gonna help us hit on Invasive Species Action Month because what it'll happen, we'll, she'll provide it to me in May to share, and she'll be sharing it with those that she shares with so that they can pop those into their June um, email blast and newsletters and whatever else that they've got coming up. And then we're doing a new video and this is where I could really use the help of all of you out there in the world. Um, if you're finding especially garden type plants that have gotten away that we're, we still find um, 
definitely get some nice pictures and and send them to me or we can put them into box i actually have a folder for her in the box ais photos folder and um b-roll footage dawn can take it and put it together just the quality has to be fairly good the photos should be high res so just keep that in mind they don't need to be you know four megabytes but they need to be what's considered high res and then she can also make site visits if it happens to be close enough. Um, she's in Southeast Wisconsin, and but she does travel. So if you've got something hot, let me know. And if she happens to be in the area, we might be able to visit that so they could get a little footage of her looking at the site or whatever. And then um, I mentioned the last two already, and that's what I've got. So let's see here if they have any specific questions in chat. Oh, there we've got the Some of the resources Tim was sharing in one of the videos. Yeah. And then, yeah, all kinds of good stuff people are sharing in here. Yeah, and Pat, they mentioned Pat, and um, one of the things Melinda absolutely loves is the uh, guide from the Healthy Lakes um, website. So she will probably be using that and sharing that during the webinar because it's just a great uh, item to um, to get out to, to people because it tells them what they can plant that would be good for them. So that is all I've got. Okay, so um, Jeannie, you're seeing my presentation, correct? Yep. Okay, great. So I have a whole bunch, like I have, I think 25 slides uh, for just a few minutes. So some of these are gonna go really fast. Um, but I think Jeannie and I have been uh, just talking a little bit about, and this is something that we've been talking about for years on just you know, how can we um, kind of manage the feelings about uh, AIS response and invasions, you know, and have it not be so fearful. Like this is definitely not something that we want to have happen, but you know, even though every invasion is theoretically preventable because human behavior can change, um, you know, this is gonna happen. And so we're going to need to manage it. So how can we best do that? And spoiler, I don't think I have anything definitive for you right now. Hopefully that's something that we will have in the future, but I do think that this is a good time to just kind of reiterate things that we know already and then have uh, just a short discussion to uh, you know, kind of get ourselves ready uh, for some work down the road. So I apologize if this is like the eighth time in the past few months you've seen some of these slides, but I just wanted to make sure that we were all kind of on the same page before we got started with our conversation. And so, you know, a question that I've been really interested in you know, kind of recently is how does our language around invasions impact feelings and you know, the actions people are willing to take? And there's a lot of different you know, kind of standard ways people default to talking about invasions, you know, using different metaphors or trying to be, uh, you know, really scientific and not use value laden um, language. And so there's a bunch of different ways that we do that. And we have you know, much more limited research on how these different communication frames uh, you know, impact you know, the thoughts, feelings, and actions of people. So you know, the few things that we do you know, like know from the scientific literature, you know, if we talk about uh, invasive species as either a driving force of environmental change versus uh, a passenger of kind of environmental change, people are much, uh, they, have an increased perception of risk and an increased willingness to take action when we talk about invasive species as a driving force of environmental change. So like zebra mussels have filtered the Great Lakes so much that I mean, this is kind of a cool thing, <laughs> but you have these awesome photos of shipwrecks in the Great Lakes that you never had before because the water's so clear and you know, uh, zebra and quagga mussels you know, are part of the driving force of that. Um, so that's more impactful to people than you know talking about uh, invasive species spreading around because of human activity. Um, you know, this is an important part of the story, obviously, but you know, this is um, less inspiring to people in order to you know, get them to take action. 
you know, there's other work that's been done that, you know, they had kind of like the same ad uh, picture, but different language around it, uh, looking at different kind of regulations and norms to see how that might influence people's uh, willingness to take or willingness to take action. And I think the, the legal frame it, uh, had a slightly higher kind of motivation, something that, you know, uh, Brett Shaw kind of noted about this study is that through some of his work, the image is has a much bigger influence on somebody's actions or their perception of the ad than uh, the language does. So that's something that we tested in our metaphor study that you know, a lot of these slides are from. But I really like this paper, I think from 2016 from a, a Dutch researcher where she's summarizing a lot of uh, invasive species communication research. And I thought there was a really useful paragraph on kind of perspectives of responsible metaphor management. And according to some previous researchers, you know, ecologists have the tendency to overlook the value dimensions of the terms they use. And in, yeah, that's especially common in invasion biology. So um, as invasive species professionals, we are not quite as aware of uh, you know, the the connotations of some of the language that we use. And in the case of invasion biology, uh, the metaphors and some of that language has often contributed to the climate of fear that exists. So, you know, uh, despite maybe some of our best efforts, we're still contributing to this problem of kind of this climate of fear around invasions, which could have an impact in our ability to manage invasive species. And so there's other literature that supports this. The invasion literature uses more militaristic language than other sciences. And, you know, kind of back up to that other point that uh, the basic science journals that you might have uh, more of your researchers in it tend to use it more. That you know, maybe they're a little uh, removed from kind of the applied aspect of it. And so, you know, people are talking about how we can kind of better manage our language to get people to feel the right way about invasive species. So what message frames are actually being used? Like what's contributing to this you know, climate of fear? Well, we have our militaristic frames, you know, talking about waging war and enemies and, you know, being a warrior against, you know, this non-native species. And, you know, I'm not just uh, criticizing everyone else, I've done it too. <laughs> um, so we, here's our Stop the Spiny video, which uh, I still really like, but uh, it leans very heavily into uh, the militaristic metaphor and maybe trying to you know, purposely create that climate of fear. Um, we maybe backfired a little bit <laughs> uh, with some humor, which we saw in some uh, kind of preliminary evaluations for this. Um, and then I think some of the nativist frames too are contributing to this, just this idea of this unwelcome, unwanted other, uh, I think can be problematic in terms of, you know, how we might perceive a species and their potential impacts, or it may not help us think objectively about things. And how do these uh, different message frames impact the actions people take? Uh, there are, again, uh, I talked about some some research that suggested this. And then just from our metaphor study too, uh, we have kind of some qualitative data and just anecdotes on how, you know, if we talk about or display a certain invasive species message, it seems to have steered the conversation certain ways. So if we uh, use this nativist frame, it doesn't really uh, produce useful conversation. Where if we used our kind of scientific, just fact-based frame, we tend to add a lot tended to have a lot more meaningful engagement on that. So this is something that's kind of reinforcing these ideas to me. There's also uh, in some unintended consequences of invasive species messaging work that's being completed right now uh, that's led by Brett Shaw and Dominique Broussard from UW Life Science Communications and then some graduate students and I've helped out a little bit on it too. So we're finishing up the reports on this right now. Uh, we have a peer reviewed article that we're working on. So I'm excited to share all of this when we can, but you know, just some preliminary results here. Uh, this was a survey of Lakeshore property owners of had a whole bunch of different things, but something you know that kind of jumped out at me that was easy to share was that you know people that perceive their lakes as having aquatic invasive species tended to feel you know frustrated, sad, and angry much more than everyone else. And so you know I think some of this language is you know contributing to these feelings. And 
you know, it's not totally unreasonable that <laughs> we jumped to this kind of language and uh, metaphors to communicate about invasive species, because I feel like intuitively we all uh, have this feeling that this is going to help get people to take the actions that we might want. And, you know, we're not wrong that um, I'm learning more about some of this stuff uh, right now, but uh, the extended parallel process model, which would be one model of human behavior, really looks at, you know, kind of the combination of our, you know, our ability to take action against a threat combined with our perception of the threat in terms of, you know, how susceptible we are to it or how severe it is, you know, and so this can lead to, you know, uh, a fear control process or a danger control process. And I think within invasive species management, we might tend to have a lot more people on this fear control management, um, which might be a little bit more difficult to manage than this danger control process. So just kind of me thinking out loud. So this has gotten me to think about what are our own experiences with uh, you know, managing uh, responses to invasions and just trying to help people work through this problem and how can you know, we make our jobs easier but also have better outcomes from the people that we're helping. And so uh, we thought that it might be useful to just have you know, 15 minutes of discussion to maybe dive into this a little bit and compare and contrast some experiences we've all had. You know, and I think, I think we'll have 10 to 15 minutes in small groups just to talk about uh, some response experiences. And I think it'd be useful for people to share you know, a time that they were part of a response experience that was, you know, especially fearful, that, you know, fear seemed to be the primary motivating factor. And, you know, talk a little bit about what that was like, what some of the outcomes were, um, and then contrast that with an experience that was relatively calm. You know, what was that like? Uh, what were some of the outcomes? And then, you know, were things a little bit easier to manage on, uh, you know, one experience versus the other? Or, um, are there some common threads between, you know, the fearful experiences or the, the relatively calm experiences? So I think that's what I'd like us to uh, discuss when we go out into the breakout rooms. And I will be sure to uh, share all of this text, or, or I'll encourage you to take a screenshot of it quickly. Um, and then I'll stop sharing it here in a second. And before we go into breakout rooms, I will uh, copy the text into the chat. So you're ready for me to try to get these to work this time? Yeah. <laughs> okay, this time I just recreated the rooms you were in before, so you should be pre-assigned. If someone new popped in, I will get you added. And I've got it set to 15 minutes, so we should be good. Whoops. Patrick, I face before. <laughs> I, I have one, yes. Yes, I'm so happy. <laughs> Seeing faces is good. I'm still getting some people back. Hey, my original group. I don't know what happened. Jeannie was like switching me around or something. Uh, I got boofed mid-sentence. We'll never know what you were going to say now. I know, wow. and I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't, after you texted back, I didn't tell them. She said, I don't know what happened. I got put in a different room. <laughs> anyway, Jamie said weird. <laughs> Tim's, Tim's going to grab, he said he's going to jump off right after sharing. So Tim, let's get going on sharing then so you can get to your next meeting. And if the rest of us can just stick around or record out and I have just two little slides to share at the end. So I feel like on our group, um, we had enough to talk about just on kind of fearful responses, although that's probably a lot of them. <laughs> so we all probably have a lot to talk about. Um, so that's mostly where we stuck. Um, but I feel like we had a pretty good uh, discussion there. And it, it seemed that, you know, I don't know, maybe a common theme could be that it does seem there might be some disconnect between how we as managers or people like professionals are thinking about issues and reacting to issues versus how um, the local organizations might be reacting to that. So when they get that news, they might be, you know, fearful, unhappy, angry. But you know, in a particular example, you know, a lake that was recently discovered to have zebra mussels was right next to a bunch of other zebra mussels lakes and close to the Great Lakes. So from a risk perspective, like you'd kind of guess that that <laughs> lake might get them, get zebra mussels eventually. So, you know, 
I don't know if that could kind of um, kind of contribute to some of the problems there. And in some of the cases we talked about too, that you know it seemed like the the local groups had a desire to like jump or sorry jump to an answer right away on how they're going to manage their problem. That you know let's do something that we can do right now. Um, to take action, which very often is some sort of chemical treatment because, you know, you can, you know, um, maybe if you don't understand uh, kind of all the mechanisms behind something, you might think that a chemical treatment is something you can just do. It takes care of the problem and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. So there's this desire to just really jump to this quick conclusion or quick answer for things when maybe this like longer process might work a little bit better. And for the relatively calm response, um, we didn't have as much conversation here, but um, one comment was that lakes that tended to be a little bit, um, or lakes that tended to be uh, less excited about herbicides tended to take a, you know, maybe a slower approach that they were calmer and they followed the guidance on planning for, or planning on when an AIS was found, which made it a little bit easier to manage. So surprise, following guidance <laughs> made it a little bit better. <laughs> um, so that was our Maddie discussion. Maddie probably like to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> cool, thank you. Yep. And thank you for the help this morning and we'll say goodbye to Tim so he can go to his other meeting. Um, what room wants to go next? I don't know what number he is and I could say one, two, three, four, but I don't know what room Tim was in. So if he wasn't in number one, how about you guys? Who was in room number one? I don't even, no, I don't even recall seeing a room number, so. Oh, well in that case, just jump in if you were the note taker or whatever. I was a note taker, hi. Hey, Sue. Um, our, our group had um, Matt Walrath, Chris Hammerla, Kathy Higley, myself, Liana Spencer, R Ramona. Um, sorry if I missed anybody else. Um, we talked about um, how um, sometimes individuals will call an agency in response to some inflamed fear or rumors that got out of control. Um, Kathy mentioned it was an opportunity to educate people. It calms them down and then get them oriented toward a more um, constructive response. Um, so it takes a little time, but it's an opportunity to reach out and hopefully get that more calm message and more constructive orientation out there. Um, there was another situation mentioned where fear of, um, and, and our 40 species that was introduced inspired a very quick agent or like intra agency partnership to respond. So fear was actually useful in that case, but I, this isn't talking about the public. So I think that that talks maybe refers a little bit to what Tim was saying about kind of a dichotomy between um, public versus professionals. Um, so yeah, there's a big difference in who we're talking about. Um, there was another comment that um, fear might be worse for animal introductions than plant introductions partly because of the work of Michelle Nault and our, you know, our new understanding that milfoil does, once it's introduced, doesn't mean your lake is going to die. A lot of lakes don't really, um, you know, go real far south or have a high population. But with animals, um, maybe there's no constructive response except education for like zebra mussels, for example, there's no control. Um, we also talked about, um, Matt brought up a big issue that I think, um, probably a lot of groups will is, um, how do we not use a language of fear? Um, what's the alternative? Um, uh, Chris said that, um, well, in his, his case, he tries to focus on the good quality habitat that we're trying to protect and the good, um, you know, the benefits um, of what we already have there to, to try to get people involved in monitoring prevention and protection. Um, Kathy noted that sometimes late groups will have a mission statement that um, is focused wholly on exotics and their control instead of looking at a bigger picture. So she tries to get them to look at a bigger picture and not be so um, maybe fear oriented. Um, and Matt said, you know, we should try to provide better context, a more holistic perspective. So that's a summary of what our group talked about. 
Good summary. Um, I actually can look at who was in the rooms now. So, so Sue is reporting on room two. How about somebody, let's see, um, the room that had Sam and Tom in it, who was the reporter for that group? I took some quick notes. Our conversation, uh, this is Sam Coin. Um, I lost my camera, unfortunately. Um, so uh, we kind of touched on the questions, but they kind of veered off in conversation. So pertaining to the questions, when we talked about what was fearful, um, Jake Devine uh, had, was it Jake? I can't remember who, but um, we were talking about um, responses to prohibited species. And that initially uh, reaching out to landowners for prohibited species, it's a lot more of like you have to control and it can be really enforce, like related, enforcement related. Um, and that seemed to really uh, make landowners hesitant or kind of freaked out. Um, and then when the language softened to being, you know, more of a conversational tone that we found that landowners were more receptive and that it was more of like an understanding base. Um, and so I, I think that's kind of where we landed with the fearful versus calm and kind of those different situations. Um, but we kind of spiraled the conversation into more of um, how we're structured and identifying species and that sort of thing. So it veered off topic a little. Okay, that's fine. Um, good, good, interesting. Oh, and just real quick, anyone who did take the notes, if you could share those with me so I can kind of get them all in one place, and because this might help inform some other work Tim's doing and that Brett Shaw's doing with his unintended consequences work. So we might be able to, to put this to additional use. Uh, the group that had Anna, Emily, Jason, AJ, and Amy, is there someone that could report out on that group? So in our conversations, one of the, we kind of touched on three major themes. The first one was, it, it, it was like a fear of like a, a lost, lost uh, productivity kind of, kind of feeling. So that when you have lakes and you have people that are working on lakes and they're being very diligent and they're tracking um, all these locations frequently, once the, a, a species is then introduced into that lake, they feel as though that they've they've kind of lost what they've um, their their accomplishment so far by by keeping things out of the lake instead of focusing on like it's a good idea that they were being diligent and seeing the new detection. The second one was um, once a new species like Staria stormwort is found within the lake, um, the fear of immediate action that some some activity has to be done to control the species right away. And then the third one is that with all the different invasive species that we have, people have a focused fear on one particular species more than any other. And they, they may be looking at that one, trying to see if it is arriving in their lake rather than trying to understand larger changes in, in the lake structure with new species coming in. Other than like that one focal charismatic nefarious species like starry or Eurasian water milfoil. Wow, this sounds like you guys had great, great conversations. Um, who was in a room with Tim? So I don't call on you a second time because the, the name falls off once the person leaves. Who had Tim in their room? Just so I know which room it was. You might have to unmute if you're muted. Okay, let's try it this way. Um, in a room with Tim. Um, okay. Egren was. Okay, I see. So you guys are room six. So yeah. I'm going to backtrack then to the room that had Chris Acey, Chris Larson, Paul Skolinski, Scott Frank, Scott Owen Shelby, Adler, and Stephanie. I can share a little bit what we talked about. Um, we had a, an interesting conversation similar to uh, one of the other rooms that reported out that we started talking about invasives in non-native language and then went into other areas that we're seeing similar kind of language. So a couple uh, interesting points that led to some great discussion that people brought up. Um, 
uh, Stephanie talked about uh, non-native versus invasive, and she's always trying to put that in perspective with folks when she's talking, ed educating anybody. Um, Paul Skowinski noted something that some shoreline users, uh, shoreline owners, excuse me, when they're uh, doing management on their property, they're almost viewing our native shoreline plants as invasive. So they're saying, oh, I'm doing invasive management by clear cutting the native plants. So trying to get that education and that uh, terminology correct um, has been a, an area of focus. Um, and everyone in the room seemed to really uh, draw attention to trying to use non-native more than invasive, um, mm -hmm. just trying to bring, to, to differentiate, yes, we have plants that are in our lakes or along the shorelines that are beneficial um, compared to, you know, boaters coming out of the water saying, oh, look at all these weeds on my, my trailer. Well, weeds has that same negative connotation. So that same kind of thing. And then Shelby Adler also brought up a really interesting point of using the scientific name rather than the common name, especially, um, if it's polarizing, so Asian clam, she meant, used that as an example and said instead she tries to use like corbicula um, mm. when she's educating folks to try and erase some of those potentially negative connotations or dividing uh, terminology. That's a good idea. Um, yeah, I like that. And before we went to the breakout room, so it was a discussion in the chat, people were trying to figure out well, what did tribal populations call things. And it sounds like it may vary a bit by the tribal nation, but um, we do have um, some folks tomorrow that might actually be able to an help answer that question. And the last room left to do any reporting out, if I am looking at it right, would be the one with Ann, Kyle, Maureen, and Patrick. We did not designate a note taker, so I'll do my best <laughs> to, to try to remember what we talked about. But okay. I mean, we gave a few examples of, of species where people really have a lot of fear. Like in my world, it's jumping worms. Like you just talk about jumping worms around gardeners and they're just like, can't handle it. Um, and also starry stormwort as an example. Um, and then we, like other groups, talked about how different people respond differently. So people that live on a lake are very invested in what's happening in their lake and they might be um, perceiving like starry stormwort as a, as a huge threat and spend a lot of time and energy really worrying about it um, no matter what other people may be telling them or like DNR or other aquatic invasive species experts might be telling them. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting a lot of... <laughs> other things we talked about. I think Maureen mentioned, you know, it's, it's analogous to, and I don't know if this was her direct thought or if she was paraphrasing somebody else's thoughts, but, you know, it's kind of like with, with COVID, we've all gotten used to making changes because of COVID, like social distancing and wearing masks. And that, that's kind of a similar thing if you have a new invasive species in a lake or in an area, like, you can adapt to it in certain situations. Things might be different, but it's not cause for like completely freaking out, I guess. That's all I can remember. <laughs> okay, that's good. Well, thank you everybody. Um, I did figure out how to do YouTube today. I don't have things, it's a process, so we'll have this part recorded along with everything else. Um, once I extension end of things does their thing, but um, any, like I said, any notes you wanna send, please do. And so I don't have to listen to three hours of the meeting just to get to this part if the forwarding is difficult. <laughs> and I just wanna quick share a couple other things just to wrap up for today. So I shared the, um, dates and what's going on with the ice packs and towels the other day in a listserv email. We're basically just going to use whatever was left from last year, but I do have the towels and the brand new drain campaign towel coming in um, for next year. But it really boiled down to money, timing, logistics, stuff like that. And most people having kept what they had last year. So um, it would have been impossible 
to efficiently deal with that. And then I didn't remember to include other than that email that the Great Lakes Landing Blitz are gonna do year three, and I have not been able to participate in any of the planning meetings yet, but will be, and it's gonna cover June 26th through July 4th. So ours is the first through the fourth. So we will be participating in that by way of the, the overlap and probably doing some sharing of materials that'll come out about that. And then for tomorrow, we are going to join this. Everyone who's signed up for that will be joining on the Sysma Focus Day. And 